Bladen. Uh, I'm a research associate in the Department of Zoology at the University of Cambridge. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about a project uh, that was, I've been working on for the last couple of years um, with the Insect Ecology Group, uh, trying to understand the impacts of temperature on butterflies in the UK. Uh, so the Insect Ecology Group uh, is one of the research groups within the Department of Zoology, and we particularly focus on um, understanding species ecology and conservation. Uh, we work very closely with the local wildlife trusts uh, for Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and Northamptonshire. Um, and uh, so we do a lot of work, a lot of our field work on their uh, reserves, uh, primarily down in Bedfordshire. And what we're interested in really is trying to understand uh, species requirements, their habitat requirements, their responses uh, to changing environments, in, including habitat and temperature, um, and how this uh, can be used to inform uh, better reserve management um, to try and uh, improve species conservation. So a lot of that work um, focuses on butterflies um, for uh, what we think are very good reasons. So uh, we have uh, a reasonably good knowledge of butterfly ecology already, which makes them quite a good uh, attractable group to study in terms of um, uh, representing uh, the, the ecology of, of, of other groups of species as well. Um, butterflies, although not, not fantastically diverse, um, incorporate, in the UK at least, incorporate a range of uh, habitat generalists and habitat specialists. So this goes from species that have uh, very broad um, habitat uh, habitats that they're able to, to exist in, um, through to specialists which are, um, as the name suggests, very, very specialised in particular environments. Um, and so this capturing this kind of range means that by looking across the entire community of butterflies, we can understand how species uh, across that spectrum um, are affected. Uh, butterflies also have very diverse life cycles, um, moving obviously from the, the uh, very immobile larval stage uh, to the very mobile adult stage generally, um, which means that they, and, and these different parts of the life cycle require very different things from their environment. They go from being herbivores uh, to, to feeding on nectar um, and, and their dispersal ability uh, varies quite dramatically. And this means that they're sort of reflecting some of the, the other range of requirements of other invertebrates. Um, they're also fairly sensitive to environmental change. And so they act as a bit of a bellwether for what might be going on um, at sites or across the country. Um, and so their changes in butterfly populations can tell us something about um, habitat suitability uh, more generally, which, which is hopefully relevant to a, to a whole group of other species. So as I'm sure uh, many of you are aware of, um, insects are unfortunately in decline. Um, this is a paper which was published a couple of years ago uh, that I've, I've chosen because I think it's, it's one of the most striking uh, results in terms of, uh, of looking at kind of long-term trends in insect abundance. This was a study that was conducted in Germany, um, where over the period of about a quarter of a century, uh, they found a 75% decline in the raw abundance of, of flying uh, invertebrate biomass. Um, so this was not doing anything to look at kind of species composition um, or abundance of individual species or, or um, richness. It's simply the mass of the, the, the weight of, of in, invertebrates caught in malaise traps um, on a nature reserve. So this isn't even in an area of sort of uh, huge environmental change. This is within a nature reserve or, or a network of nature reserves. Um, and, and, and they detect these quite shocking declines um, over, over 27 years, which is quite worrying. And this, isn't, this is a trend that isn't, you know, uh, is going on in butterflies as much as in, as in any other groups. Uh, so this is data from the UK from um, butterfly conservation. Um, and what these graphs show are counts of the number of species uh, blocked into different changes um, in, in abundance on the top graph and in occurrence based on the number of grid squares in the bottom graph. And what you can see is that anything in red um, are species that are declining and anything in blue is species that are increasing. Um, and from a simple sort of eyeball of the data, um, you can tell that far more species are shown in red than in blue. There's obviously this um, slight uh, skew um, up in the you know over 100% increase in, in in a number of species here, and these tend to be species that have received uh, that are either doing very well uh, because of climate change probably and, and have expanded quite rapidly, or they're species which have received a lot of conservation attention 
and grown from very small numbers. So the large blue is a really good example of that because it was um, extinct back in the 70s. Um, and so and so it's, you know, on, undergone huge increases since then because it's gone from basically nothing. Um, this pattern, this is the sort of long term trend from uh, the 1970s uh, to the last decade. Things look a little bit better if you look at the short term trend. Um, so this is this is for sort of 10 years up to 2014. And you can see there are slightly more species up in the blue. Um, and this is probably a combination of, um, again, uh, some species perhaps being being favoured by climate change, but in a lot of cases, um, positive results of conservation action uh, for for particular uh, species in particular locations that have have seen their numbers recover somewhat. Um, but there's still a large chunk of species uh, that are declining or have declined in the last the last ten years as well. Um, so what are the the major threats to butterflies and to insects more generally? Well, the big one is probably habitat change. This has obviously been going on for quite a long time, um, uh, primarily because of urbanization and, and agriculture. Um, and this leads to increased fragmentation between habitats, uh, which makes it harder for species to disperse, um, to move through the landscape, and for, for gene flow to occur between populations um, to help them keep going. Um, there's also probably a big effect of pollution. Um, it's obviously really important for insects. Uh, we put out a lot of pesticides into the environment for, for agriculture and for gardening, um, and this has a detrimental in, impact on um, a number of invertebrate species. And now, of course, there's the added um, uh, impact of climate change, which um, can be both positive and negative. Um, so broadly, I think species have three different ways uh, that they will respond to changes um, in the climate. The first of those is that they can adapt. So some species may have enough um, enough plasticity in their behavior or in their genetics that actually they can cope with a change, um, at, at least the smallest changes in temperature. Um, and this will mean that this might allow them to undergo a, a degree of evolution and adaptation such that they can persist in the same locations as they're currently found as the climate changes and those locations warm up a little bit. If they can't survive in those locations, what, what happens quite a lot, and there's quite a lot of evidence for this, is that they begin to shift their range. So this essentially happens because populations in the south of a species distribution start to struggle because it gets too hot, but populations in the north actually do quite well because um, the climate's becoming more suitable. And so over time, they're able to expand their range northwards whilst retracting in the south. And this leads to an overall sort of shift um, in, their, in their distribution across uh, the country or across the continent. But if species are unable to do either of these two things, then they're likely to suffer population declines. And these declines are hindered um, by the habitat loss and fragmentation I've already talked about, um, because it makes it that much harder for species to be able to move through a landscape if the patches of suitable habitat are further and further apart. But these sort of population responses uh, to climate change that I'm talking about here are only kind of telling us so much. This is what's going on to the for the species as a whole, but actually this this big picture response to climate change is going to be caused by how individual animals actually respond to day-to-day -day changes in temperature. How how well a species is able to cope, individuals of, of species are able to cope with a change in temperature in uh, a particular site. And so it's important for us to understand how individuals respond to fine scale temperature changes in order for us to really get to grips with how climate change is likely to affect them. So what does this mean in the context of butterflies? Well, recent um, population declines and to some extent range, range expansions suggest that there is a level of climate sensitivity in butterflies. Um, Interestingly, uh, the UK is probably projected to gain more species than we're projected to lose um, because of climate change. And this is a, a quirk of our location, really. We have quite a large number of species which reach their northern range boundary um, in the UK or in, in France and the Netherlands and haven't quite made it to the UK. And we have relatively few uh, northern specialist species. We do have some, um, but relatively few species that are at the southern edge of their range boundary. So those would be the small number of species that we're projected to lose, whilst we're projected to gain um, 
other species which are currently found in France and in Spain and maybe uh, struggling and declining there, but the UK is potentially going to become more suitable for them. And so over the next sort of 20 or 30 years, it's quite important for us to think about how uh, we can begin to uh, manage our reserves, not only to favour the persistence of uh, the species that they already have, but also to try and allow species that are moving northwards to, to come in and, and to colonise these, these sites as well. Um, but it's undoubtedly true that for some species, um, they're in, in spite of an, a potential improvement in climate, um, they are still in decline due to overriding impacts of, of habitat loss and habitat change. So how do temperatures uh, in effect, affect individual butterflies and indeed probably in individual insects? Um, well, it's generally assumed that there'll be that rising temperature is quite positive. It enables insects to be more active uh, because they're exotherms, they can't control their own, their own body temperature physiologically in the same way as, as birds and mammals can. So it enables them uh, to become more active, potentially more territorial, um, and therefore have higher biological fitness, i.e. a better chance of breeding. Um, and this is shown quite nicely by some work um, done by Matt Hayes, who you're going to hear from after me, um, uh, which shows that the Duke of Burgundy, um, a specialist species in the UK and one of one of our butterflies of highest conservation concern, um, for them, high temperatures are really important uh, for territorial behaviour. So you can see the red line um, shows that non-territorial flights kind of occur at the same frequency um, across a whole range of temperatures. But territorial flights really only um, take off, if you like, um, at, at the higher end of, of temperatures. And this is a species that flies in May. Um, and so, you know, these sort of warm days are really important uh, for them to be able to perform their kind of territorial behaviour. And so it's then important for us to start to think about the ways in which butterflies um, can have some way of mediating their body temperature. And they can do this broadly in a couple of different ways. They can do things like changing their wing position or their body angle uh, with respect to the sun um, to uh, alter their body temperature. So they, they might be basking with their wings open or they can kind of close up their wings and turn away from the sun if they want to cool down. Um, but they can also use the landscape. Um, and this is probably what a lot of um, uh, insects do, uh, use the landscape to find warm and cool patches across it. Um, to help themselves alter their body temperature. So when I talk about this, what I'm talking about really is the idea of microclimates. Um, microclimates are locations within a landscape where uh, the temperature, the humidity, the wind speed, the soil moisture uh, will vary from the ambient conditions of that location. And crucially, these are, these are, um, this is variation which is rarely picked up by weather stations because weather stations are designed for very good reason to be very standardized. We want to be able to, they're, they're set up to enable us to compare um, the difference um, between different locations um, across the UK in a standardized way. So a weather station tends to be in the middle of an open field, it's shaded, it's about a meter and a half above the ground. Um, and it's, so it's recording a very standardized set of meteorological conditions. But this almost never reflects um, what an animal living in that environment in that location is actually going to experience. Um, because, yeah, I mean, in the case of most invertebrates, they're, they're probably gonna be much closer to the ground. They might be exposed to direct sunlight. Um, the, they might, the, there might be much higher wind speeds um, than can happen inside a weather station. Um, and so this kind of variability isn't captured by traditional meteorological recording. Um, and the variation is caused by a whole host of different things. So it could be to do with the height of the ground, it could be to do with uh, changes in topography, vegetation structure and shelter across the landscape. And this is illustrated by the figures that I've got on the right hand side. So this is these are two photographs of uh, the same environment. Um, so a normal color photograph on the top and uh, a thermal image on the bottom. And this is an alpine hillside. Um, so you can see in the normal color image up the top, you've got an area of grassland above the tree line. Um, and then down a bit more into the valley, uh, you've got um, some trees and you've also got areas of bare slope um, uh, facing in different directions across the landscape. And what's interesting about this image is you might naively assume that an area which is higher, at higher elevation, would be cooler than an area uh, which is lower down. 
And this would probably be true if you were talking about exactly the same um, habitat. But actually what happens here is because the grassland is more exposed, this photo is taken in the middle of the day, you can see that the grassland area at higher elevation is actually substantially warmer than the forested area below. So this is down in the green at about eight degrees. Um, the grasslands are up in 14, 15, even 16 degrees um, because they're exposed to direct sunlight and they don't have the buffering effect of the trees. And if you look across the rest of the landscape, you can also see other patches. So some of these slopes that are presumably sort of a little bit shaded, um, not in the full force of the sun, are quite cool. Whereas in other places, um, on the other side of the valley, they're very, very warm. Um, and so this is what we mean when we talk about microclimates. And this kind of diversity across the landscape at a local scale could be really important for um, butterflies, other, other insects, and actually all animals um, for finding favourable temperatures um, in, in a changing climate. And so previous work has shown at a broad scale that these kind of landscapes with diverse microclimates actually have a lower risk of species extinction. Um, and uh, it's important for us to understand how individuals respond to these fine scale temperature changes so that we can start to inform um, climate change mitigation um, strategies for nature reserves. Um, so in this piece of work, uh, we tackled four questions um, about how butterflies uh, responded on an individual level to changes in temperature. The first was uh, to ask whether butterfly species differ in their response to fine scale temperature variation. The second was to look across species and see whether there were any particular traits uh, that predicted their responses to temperature. We then went on to think about the thermoregulatory strategies that species use. Um, and finally, um, then went to see whether these individual level responses could actually tell us anything about species long term population trends. So this work was conducted, as I mentioned at the start, primarily um, on uh, some wildlife trust reserves down in Bedfordshire. So we had um, Tottenham Quarry and Tottenham Knolls, Pegston Hills and Blows Downs, which are down in South Bedfordshire, all owned and managed by uh, the local wildlife trust. Um, but we did some additional data collection uh, at Winterboard Downs, which is an RSPB reserve in Wiltshire, um, Urtenfell and Horswater up in Cumbria, um, and Ben Laws in Scotland. And just to give you a feel for some of these sites, um, we uh, the sites in Bedfordshire are species rich chalk grassland. Um, as you can see from this photo, this is Tottenham Quarry, uh, but they're all very topographically diverse. They've got a range of vegetation structures and they're, they're species rich, not only in terms of their um, insect fauna, but also in terms of the flora as well. And um, so they've got a fantastic range of, of chalk grass and specialist plants. In Wiltshire, um, it's a slightly different site, it's chalk again, um, but this is actually a, a, an area which is in arable reversion, so it's previously farmed um, and is now being uh, converted back into species rich grassland. Um, and in addition has um, uh, a, a chalk bank, which has been specially created uh, to try and increase the topo topographic diversity on the site. And finally, up in Cumbria and in Scotland, um, we're working in, a, we're working in upland habitats, um, uh, graze landscapes um, with, with, with sort of PT uplands. Um, and this was particularly to look for uh, one of the UK's upland specialist species, the mountain ringlet, which is shown on the left. So what did we do? Well, um, in Bedfordshire, uh, we conducted monthly surveys uh, between May and September in 2009 and then in 2018. Um, and this was uh, searching the whole site uh, to record every butterfly that we could find. And we caught a subset of those individuals to take a body temperature reading from them. And we did this using a fine temperature probe, um, which uh, you can poke through um, the the holes in the net just touch against the thorax and this gives you a temperature reading instantaneous temperature reading of, uh, of the external body temperature of the butterfly. Uh, we also at the same time recorded the air temperature in the shade at waist height and if the butterfly had been perching or nectaring or basking on a on a leaf or a plant um, at the time of capture we also took the temperature off that location um, and that will become important later. And then in the other sites away from Bedfordshire, 
uh, we didn't do systematic surveys, but we, we did dedicated catching uh, to primarily to try and get this, this body temperature data um, from the butterflies. So the first question was whether uh, species differ in their response to fine scale temperature variation. And broadly, um, what we found was that there were three different types of responses. So the first is illustrated by the large white on the left, um, where in each of these figures, we've got air temperature along the, the bottom and body temperature up the side. Uh, the black solid line is giving you a simple one to one relationship. Um, and the dotted line is giving you uh, the, the fitted regression um, to, to the data that's available for that species. So for the large white, you can see that over a wide range of air temperatures, they exhibit a relatively narrow range of body temperatures. So what they're doing, or they appear to be doing, is, is, is effectively buffering their body temperature against this change of air temperature. For other species, such as the painted lady, you can see that Broadly, they're sort of tracking air temperature. They're a few degrees warmer um, at, at all times, but that's pretty consistent over the range of air temperatures experienced. And then for a third group of species typified by the Duke of Burgundy, you can see that actually over a relatively narrow range of air temperature, they exhibit quite a wide range of body temperature. So this is showing that they're actually heating up faster than their environment, um, which could be really important for this species because, as I mentioned, it flies in May. Um, and so it's relatively cool and it may need to heat itself up um, quite a lot at lower temperatures, but this could become problematic at higher temperatures if they're unable to control that heat gain. So just to give you an overview, the details of this slide don't matter, but this is the same, exactly the same figures, but produced for all 29 species that we were able to monitor. And you can see essentially the, the range of slopes um, in, in, in the, the dotted lines. You can see the brimstone here has got a relatively flat slope, um, the mountain ringlet has got a steeper slope next to it. So that's just to give you a kind of overview of the range of, of uh, responses across species. So we then wanted to see whether uh, there were any traits um, of species that predicted this ability. Um, and so on this, this figure, uh, we've got the wingspan of the species along the bottom and the buffering ability up the side. And what we did here, uh, th this, this buffering ability is essentially the slope of the relationship that we fitted on the previous slide. And so what you see is that the, there was a marked difference between butterfly families. So in general, the white butterflies uh, had relatively good buffering ability. That is quite a shallow slope. Um, and the nymphalid butterflies, um, the, the brushfoots, uh, had a relatively poor buffering ability. So they, they generally, on average, had steeper slopes. You can see that the um, Duke of Burgundy on its own in its own family down here was actually a bit of an outlier um, and was particularly bad at buffering. Um, but within each family, there was also a strong effect of size. So smaller species tended to be worse at buffering and have less control over their body temperature than larger species. And this is typified uh, just down the bottom by the gatekeeper and the peacock, both um, members of the Nymphalidae. Uh, the peacock being larger had a generally better buffering ability and the gatekeeper smaller uh, had a generally poorer buffering ability. But this difference between families also um, appeared to reflect something else. Um, so it, it appears to reflect, reflect something to do with butterfly coloration. So paler species shown on the left of this figure, such as the whites in particular, tended to have a better buffering ability than the darker species shown on the right. Um, and this is something that we're looking into with some follow up work um, using museum specimens to look at uh, the difference in luminance um, of uh, the species. Um, and, and see whether that gives us any more indication of what's going on here. Um, but it seems to sort of, you know, to, to make sense um, conceptually uh, in that the paler species potentially have more options to control their, their body temperature in that they're highly reflective. And so they can potentially absorb, but also lose heat um, more easily than um, darker species. So then we went on to think about um, the different strategies that species might use um, to buffer their body temperature. And this goes back to what I was talking about before, um, where broadly we thought that species have two options um, that are open to them if they want to alter their body temperature beyond that which is being provided by the ambient temperature in the environment. The first is that they can choose a favorable microclimate. So if the ambient air temperature is too hot or too cold for them, 
they can try and find a location within the landscape which is a more optimal uh, more optimal temperature and so in order to measure this we took that perch temperature that i mentioned from from the flower that the the butterfly was sat on and subtracted the air temperature to give us that difference um, that the butterfly was achieving by choosing the location that it was using at the time of capture the second option that's open to them is a behavioral option so as as i'm sure you know butterflies can bask they angle their wings towards the sun to heat themselves up or they can turn away if they need to cool down um, and this this might enable them to alter their body temperature beyond that which is provided even by the local temperature of their perch so to measure this we took the thoracic temperature and subtracted from it the perch temperature um, to give us that the, the degree of temperature change that the butterfly was achieving beyond that which was being provided by its choice of, uh, of perch. And so what I'm going to show you on the next figure is these two, um, these two values plotted against each other. So on the bottom here, we have the difference that the microclimate is providing, but the difference between the air temperature and the, and the perch temperature. And on the side, uh, we've got the difference between the body temperature and the perch temperature, i.e. what they're doing a bit more behaviorally. And what you can see is across a range of species, there was quite a range of responses. So um, again, the, da the dash line is, is a simple one-to-one -one relationship. And so species that are closer to this line um, are more reliant upon selecting favorable microclimates within the landscape. And just as an example, I picked out the small heath, um, which you know, had seemed to have limited ability to use behavioral thermoregulation to change its temperature beyond that of its microclimate. In comparison, other species seem able to warm themselves behaviorally quite a lot um, without a particular need to use um, a, a, a different microclimate. Um, and this was typified by the comma, um, which I've highlighted here. And so broadly across this range of species, this enables us to pick out the fact that the, the comma uh, being able to inhabit potentially a wider range of thermal environments might be a thermal generalist while something like the small heath, which is potentially a bit more restricted because it depends on finding environments that are right, the right temperature for it, might be, considered, might be considered a thermal specialist. So we then wanted to see whether this sort of dichotomy between uh, generalists and spe specialists could tell us anything about species long-term population trends. Could we link this individual level data back to the sort of population level um, uh, data that I was talking about right at the start? And so on this figure, um, on the, the bottom, we've got the difference uh, between the behavioral thermoregulation and the microclimate selection. And what essentially this means is that on the right hand side, these will be thermal generalists. And on the left hand side, these will be the thermal specialists, those that are particularly reliant on their microclimate. And on the y axis, um, this is going to be plotted against the species long term change in abundance based on the UK butterfly monitoring scheme. So this is data from about covering about 40 years. And what we found was that species that are more reliant on the microclimates, those, those thermal specialists, um, have declined more severely over the last 40 years than species which could uh, alter their body temperature relatively independently of their, of their environment. And so just to pick out those same, the same two species again, the small heath is down here with quite severe population declines. Um, and, and a high degree of thermal specialism, whereas the comma is up here with a much, uh, much more positive population trend. And again, you can see that this, this effect actually split out between families as well. Um, so, that, so there's a strong difference between, between families um, as well as the, the impact of, of the specialist generalist axis. So just to summarize, um, understanding individual animals' ability uh, to cope with changing temperatures is really important for informing our predictions of how species will respond to climate change. Um, the thermoregulatory ability of species differs across a, a community of butterflies, and so the community are going to respond in very different ways um, to ongoing climate change. And the species that we probably need to be particularly concerned about are these thermal specialists, which rely heavily on the microclimate of their local environment in order to be able to control and buffer their body temperature against um, 
changes changes in in the local air temperature and so this probably adds a new as a, we're used as conservationists to thinking of um habitat specialists as being things that we need to manage for um on, on a reserve scale but actually we probably also need to start thinking about whether there are thermal specialists that we need to manage for and i think in the face of climate change this makes nature reserves really important because it means that they're not only likely to be refuges for sensitive species which prefer cooler environments within the landscape but they also act as potential stepping stones for species um, which are moving in and so with that i'd just like to finish by thanking uh the the university of cambridge and the isaac newton trust who funded the work um partners at the rspb uh the wildlife trust and the museum of zoology um a whole long list of co-authors um collaborators uh volunteers who helped with the field work and thank you very much for listening and i look forward to answering questions in the panel discussion